Howdy folks, so this is going to be a brief walkthrough of the major points of chapter four that we're going to go ahead and talk about in class, but also just for your own information. As always, feel free to pause the slides accordingly wherever you need to and read it and uh, go in depth. So without further ado, we're really just looking at trying to make sure that we're getting enough calories for whatever the demands are on our athlete. Now, when we talk about caloric efficiency, when we're using fuels, fats, the most efficient carbohydrates, not as efficient and proteins really inefficient. We can measure demand through a wide variety of methods that'll be listed later. We're going to make sure we meet those demands. So once we know how much calories somebody's using, we're going to make sure they're getting in that many calories. And that's the biggest rock to think about in this entire class, which is however many calories are going out, we want that many calories coming in when we're working with an athlete that we want them to keep their body weight where it's at. If we want them to lose weight, we put them in a caloric deficit, meaning we don't put as many calories in as we took out. And when we gain weight, we put in more calories than they're putting out. It's really, really simple, but it's the discipline day in and day out that makes this really difficult to do. And there are some ways the body is going to change over time. And we're gonna talk about some special situations. And first and foremost, what is energy? Well, in this class, we're referring to uh, calories and it's really the big C kilocalorie. Uh, you'll see kilojoules on occasion in other uh, places throughout the earth where they're looking at how many energy is in the fuel. But really, we're looking on the left here is what's known as a bomb calorimeter. We literally put food in there, we light it on fire, and we figure out how much heat it gives off. So the amount of energy that's released, that's literally what a calorie is. It's just heat energy. Now, when we're going on through and we're looking at what's going on with someone's energy content and the food they're talking about. Well, now we're looking at, it's not just the amount of grams of protein we take in or fats or carbs, but it's also how many of those grams we're going to absorb, which turns out is pretty good from nearly everything. And we're going to find we use a lot of energy to break down protein. And specifically notice guys, if we look over on the coefficient of digestibility, we see that things like our protein from legumes, so beans, is actually relatively low compared to when you look at things like meat, where it's gonna naturally be a lot more readily digested. Same thing when it comes to fat from vegetables, it's a little bit lower and gonna be a bit higher from animal sources. And carbohydrates tend to be pretty high in general, uh, except for when we look at things that are more higher fiber like fruits and otherwise, and pure sugar really gets digested easily. Now, there's a lot of ways we can measure the amount of energy somebody's using. Can go anywhere from direct calorimetry, so we see how much energy you're giving off, a suit you can wear, indirect, so we're looking at air exchange, we're looking at breathing in and out of circuits, that's gonna be spirometry. We're gonna be looking at being inside of a chamber where we're looking at air exchange, Douglas bags, which are gonna be collecting those, uh, the air that you're giving off so we can figure out how much oxygen you're extracting and carbon dioxide you're giving off. And then a number of others here, I'm not going to insult your intelligence, but when you're working with people, most of the easiest ways to get a basic idea of the caloric demands are gonna have is going to be a simple accelerometer. This is like a Fitbit, um, Apple Watch, Garmin, something that's gonna go ahead and track their steps and their movement throughout the day, and then heart rate monitoring. And like anything else, we can always write down the activity records, get an idea of how many calories are gonna burn each of these, and follow this over the long haul. Now, here's gonna be pictures of the Douglas bags on the left. Some looking at gas exchange in the center, and then that's going to be someone getting set to do some uh, spirometry, specifically when we're talking about VO2 parts. Now, our major part of caloric consumption for most everyone is going to be a resting metabolic rate. Now, these are the calories that we're burning when we're literally just laying there, sitting there, hanging out. Now, from there, the next component of calorie burn is going to be our diet induced thermogenesis, or sometimes referred to as the thermic effect of food. Now this is going to be the energy that we're going to go ahead and burn when we literally are breaking down foods. Protein has the highest uh, thermogenesis and carbohydrates is going to be pretty low as is fat. But if we increase our caloric intake, we're actually gonna be naturally increasing our thermic effect of food. And then we have the thermic effect of exercise. So obviously we're more active, we're gonna burn more energy here. This is the one that we've got the most easy control of. And so, now getting back to that calories in, calories out, well, we can literally move more. Problem is, as you lose weight, your resting metabolic rate goes down because you have a smaller body. If you're eating less calories, your dietary induced thermogenesis goes down. And because you have a lighter, more efficient body, you don't burn as many calories doing cardiovascular training as you did beforehand. 
So that's where people naturally can hit a plateau. Really, it's just the intersection between where you find balance between your average calories in and your average calories out. So I think set point thinking is a bit of a lie. It, it, there is something to be said about we're going to find natural resistance in a place that our body's naturally gonna sit, but it sits at our average calories in to our average calories out. Now on the graphs on the right, you can see someone doing something insanely high energy requirement. Notice now this is in joules of with someone who might be doing something like the Tour de France where yeah, the vast majority of their calorie burn every day is actually going to come from exercise not from that resting metabolic rate. Now, here's to give you an idea of the total amount of energy that different types of tissues in the body are gonna be using each day. Now, when we're at rest, most of our energy demand is actually gonna be coming from our brain, our liver, our heart, and our kidneys. So we're going to see just the natural turnover in those tissues is gonna be what's generating a lot of that resting metabolic rate. Now, muscle has a much higher natural metabolic rate than our fat does. Hence why if you can gain some lean mass, it helps you burn a little bit more calories at rest, but it's not of a massive magnitude. And then obviously in here, we also have like other tissues like skin, bone, the rest of our digestive tract. So there's going to be contributions that each of those are going to be making for how many calories we're using each day. So like anything else, the higher intensity the exercise is, the more calories we're going to be burning whenever we do it. So when you're looking at the caloric demand from being at rest to if you're standing up, moving around compared to walking, jogging, running, and then sprinting, your caloric demand is obviously going to increase as we go up intensity. Now we talked about energy systems. You're not always going to be able to maintain that for long periods of time. When it comes to lower limits of energy expenditure, yes, you can have zero calories each day. Not going to be a good long-term strategy. And at the same time, you're going to find athletes that have situations where they've been suppressed for so long, typically gymnasts where they're going to take in way less calories per day than what you'd expect given their activity and otherwise, because they literally have had effectively a lessening of their natural resting metabolic rate. On the upper limits of energy expenditure, that's where you're going to see things like your athlete that's really trying hard to gain a lot of weight. Some people naturally do have a much faster metabolism. Now, when we're looking at this, it's honestly only going to be an oscillation by about 20% above or below what we're going to see for the resting metabolic rate. So Someone who says they have a super slow metabolism, outside of situations where you've got some thyroid disease and otherwise, it's not gonna be as low as you'd think. And at the end of the day, it still comes back to the simple calories in, calories out. Some people just naturally don't have as many calories out per day, which it gets rough if they wanna lose weight, they're going to have to go very low calorie diets. And then finally, this is just an approximation specifically for your metabolic project of how many calories you're gonna be burning when you're doing different exercises at different body weights. So notice as we look across to the right, individuals that are bigger are naturally gonna be burning much more calories than individuals that are smaller. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when we're doing any of this, and specifically programming weight loss, as, as we lose more weight, we're once again using less calories and some more exercises continuing. And then a fun thought exercise for you guys that we've done in previous classes is looking at caloric consumption for both of these insane type of diets. And we will probably discuss these a little bit in class. So thanks for listening, guys. Have a great day.